forward button. Okay, so today we're happy to have Yu Ting Huang uh, all the way from Taiwan to tell us about the EFT Hydron. Okay, please go on. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so uh, this, uh, so my talk is about uh, some uh, some constraints. Actually, one can derive uh, constraints on the UV spectrums uh, by just going through the, the geometry of the EFT hedron, which is uh, going to be the main focus of this uh, talk. So just uh, uh, listing the collaborators on this. So uh, this, is this is based on two papers. One is the EFT hedron, which came out at the end of last year. And there's going to be another one, which uh, will appear, I think, on, on the Friday. Uh, we think it'll be on uh, this Friday on the archive. So this is, what, of course, the first paper with uh, Nima Arkani Hamid. And then we have various collaborators. So Zhe Zheng Huan is a, is, a, is, a, is a PhD student at Caltech. Laurentio Rodina is a postdoc uh, who is currently here in Taiwan. And we have great undergraduate students, uh, Li Yuan Jiang and He Chen Wen, and as well as Wei Li, who's uh, going to Boston uh, in the summer. So uh, basically, I'm going to talk about uh, theory space. And here, by theory space, we are basically discussing the space of theories that yells physical observables, which is consistent with the set of uh, fundamental principles. So for example, as usual, one will require that the, the observable to be to respect unitarity. And for example, symmetries. In our case, it will be Lorentz invariance. And generally, we explore the space by constraining observable. And since uh, I was uh, uh, reminded that the talk should be a little bit pedagog, uh, sorry, a little bit introductory level at the beginning. So uh, we're going to focus a little bit about the, 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 the observable of choice in this talk, which is the scattering amplitude uh, or the S matrix. So, the, uh, so we're going to choose uh, the S matrix. And uh, I think that most of you know that we define the S matrix as the operator that translate, translates between the in and out state. We usually separate uh, the identity part and the T part which describes the interaction is basically the scattering amplitude. And generic quantum field theory, of course, we compute the scattering amplitude perturbatively using Feynman diagrams. And, the, and that then in the end gives up some function uh, in terms of the kinematic variables. Now, perturbatively, uh, the analytic properties uh, of, gen of general scattering amplitudes are relatively well understood. Uh, just for instance, we know that uh, it must have poles and for example, branch cuts uh, for this function in the Mandelstam variables. Uh, reflecting physical thresholds. And the residue of the pole or the discontinuity of the branch cuts uh, on these thresholds will be generically given by products of uh, scattering amplitude. So it's actually, the analytic property has a recursive nature to it. So using these properties, one can often derive bounds and derive constraints on the, the theory space. So of course, this was this is this has been done or has been utilized for a long time. In the very early days, for example, Weinberg uh, used similar just to these kinds of argument to show that uh, you can just start from the consistent uh, requirement of consistent S matrix and derive general properties of gravitational electrodynamic systems. And so, for example, you can show that in this case, the notion of the theory space consists of for spin one, you can derive that it must be given by a Maxwell's equation. And for spin two, you must have a gravitational theory. And this is the famous uh, soft theorems that one would use. And that is that if you have uh, a consistent S matrix requiring that the, what the, the, the mass is moment coupling here to be consistent in the soft limit, uh, actually tells you that for if the, the particle is spin one, you derive uh, charge conservation and for, for spin two, you get the equivalence principle. And so this will, can, you, can, you can say that this is in the, the most early, the, the early version of, of carving out the space of consistent interacting theories. So here, carving out the space for spin one and for spin two, what properties does the, the interacting theory should have? Of course, we can, of course uh, in this case, we have just a single massless spin one and a single massless spin two. Uh, 
You can generalize this. So let's say we want to have multiple uh, spin one, then you can do exactly the same analysis. So let's say we, we, we write down the general ansatz for uh, the four particle scattering of general massless spin one uh, under helicity constraints and factorization, you can write down this most general uh, form that is consistent with uh, what I just said. And then you just impose that on the factorization pole, as I mentioned before, it must be given by uh, the lower point uh, amplitudes, which are three points. The three point interaction here are completely fixed by helicity considerations. And since it's completely fixed, that tells you that the residue of these poles are just are uniquely given. So it's given by this with some uh, structure constant here where the structure constant is basically describing how the different spin ones interact. So you have that uh, this thing must factorize into this residue on the pole, but then it has three poles. It has three possible factorization channels. So you want this to be consistent for all three. To, be, to have this to be consistent with all three gives you an algebraic identity uh, so each of these identity is, is, is deriving from the consistency on each channels. And for this to even have a solution, you immediately arrive at the conclusion that these structure concepts might, must satisfy uh, the, the Jacobi identity. So you can say that this algebraic identity carves out the space of consistent spin one interactions. And of course, the solution to this space will be the, the, the all possible Lie 2 algebras, because this is the, the, if you have the Lie 2 algebra, then this gives a, a consistent a structure constant will set, which will satisfy this uh, Jacobi identity. Now, of course, this is one of the main motivations behind uh, Polyakov dream, which is that uh, since we can use this kind of consistent factorization, uh, to carve out the space of consistent spin one interacting theories, then maybe uh, we can do the same for conformal theories where we also could, could do the I same. A question here. Yes. So um, even here, you could have asked, uh, what, what's the most straightforward way of seeing that this proof would suffice if you go to arbitrarily high orders? Uh, order in what? So that is, you could consider more and more complicated diagrams and require consistent factorization. And a priori, I mean, I'm not worried in this case, you could have worried that you get more and more conditions and cut down the space of Lie algebras and so forth, which doesn't happen. But is there, <laughs> you know, is there an easy way to see that in this case? Uh, certainly if we, if, I mean, if we have, if, if this solutions host, and for example, uh, by using, uh, for example, in, in, in the modern language, we can use BCFW recursion, and we can show that to use just if you have a solution to this algebra, then you can iteratively construct all the higher points, and you will always have consistent factorization. Thank you. That was the question. Yeah. Right. So, 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 yeah. So that was the, uh, probably behind the dream of Polyakov, which which we which we wants to use the, the same kind of idea on CFTs, which basically uh, asks that the correlation function also have consistent factorization in all, in, in all channels and use this as a consistency condition to carve out the space of CFT. And of course, most of you know that this has been a, a very, uh, has gained had many tremendous progress in the past 10 years. And this is the, now the famous, the, the, the conformal bootstrap pro programs where indeed we are now able to carve out the space of consistent CFDs based on the physical observable, the four point correlation function. And here the space is characterized by the spectrum, the conformal dimension of your operators. And by iteratively, so, so this was carved out just by using a single operator on the outside. And when you use multiple operators, the space can be carved out even smaller. So um, in this talk, the theory space that we're interested in is in, in terms of effective field theories. So, and we're interested in all possible effective field theory that descends from some UV completions. So to parameterize this space, basically what we're, what we're, we're saying is we're parameterizing the Wilson coefficients of these higher dimension operators. And we're looking at this from the point of view that the Wilson coefficients are parameterized, uh, whatever is the UV completion of the EFT. Uh, so just to give a, and of course we're talking about physical observables. So basically we're going to map this uh, low energy EFT into the low energy scattering amplitude, 
And so the statement that you have this exp the, these Wilson coefficient translate into that when you're looking at the low energy scattering amplitude, you're going to be you're going to have a polynomial expansion in the Mandelstam variable. So for us, we're, today we're going to focus just on the four point amplitude, and so you're going to have a a Taylor expansion in your Mandelstam variable, and the coefficients of your Taylor of your Taylor uh, expansion will be matched to the or linearly related to these Wilson coefficients here. Or you, you can even forget about these Wilson coefficients. We're going to define the EFT in terms of these uh, these GKQs. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm going to use K and Q here. So basically, they have physical meaning. So K, as you see, K is a total degree and the Mandelstam variable here. So basically K is counting the derivatives here. So higher K means higher derivative uh, operators. Q is the dependence of T. So in the center of mass frame, uh, T is related to the scattering angle. So you can say, we can say that, uh, that the, the higher powers in T is essentially uh, sensitive to the higher, power, the, the higher spin contributions to, for example, if you do a partial wave expansion. Good, so we're going to try to do impose consistency conditions on this amplitude, on, on, on the low energy amplitude and extract bounds on, on these GKQs. And these bounds on GKQ will then translate into bounds on your Wilson coefficients. Now, but just to see how these Wilson coefficients come about. So for example, you can have simple examples where, for example, you start at the UV where you have uh, just a linear sigma model uh, you can compute the UV amplitude, which, which have these massive uh, Higgs exchanges. And then in low energy, you just have these, uh, these uh, polynomial expansion. And so the fact that it's coming from this uh, Higgs exchange is reflected in the simple coefficients for all the different orders uh, for, for this polynomial expansion. If on the other hand, if for example, the UV completion is a massive, uh, uh, it's coming uh, for massive states uh, inside the loop, then the UV uh, amplitude is, is, of course, this box integral, the massive scalar box, which has this very complicated, uh, relatively complicated uh, function. But then in the low energy expansion, you still get this polynomial expansion. And in this polynomial expansion, now the coefficient changes. And, uh, and so you can see that these coefficients indeed encode the structure of the, the, the UV completion. Uh, sorry, okay, you great. Can, uh, yes. There are also massless cuts in principle, are you going yes. to include those? So, or is it going to affect what you're going to so say? So in this talk, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on the case where I'm, I'm not considering the masses cut. And in the end, I'll talk about masses cut. So, so the general point is that, uh, uh, actually I'll, I'll mention what happens when we, we include masses cut, but I actually have a, a extra slide in the end. And basically the, 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 the punchline is that most of the, 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 the results or the, the approach that we're doing here, you can apply it to masses cut with, uh, with some modification. And really the modification comes in to how we define the Wilson coefficient, because of course the coefficient will run when you consider the masses cut. So when I'm talking about bounds on these coefficients, what do I mean? by the Wilson coefficient itself. It must encode from information about the running. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in the end, but the, the, the basic point is that the structure is, 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 uh, will not change when you consider the mass. What actually changes, what do you mean by the Wilson coefficients? But I'll, I'll talk about that. Good. Uh, so now I really would guess that without the precise UV coefficients, and one might think that these coefficients are arbitrary, are, are just arbitrary. But of course, uh, we know that uh, actually this is not true, and this was presented uh, in, in a very nice paper, uh, I think around uh, 15 years ago, uh, by Adams, Arkani, Hamid, Dabowski, Nikolais, and Ratazzi. And so basically, I'm just 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 you explain that in a very simple example. Uh, so let's consider an EFT with just let's just consider the four derivative coupling here with some A coefficients. Uh, now the USA from the low energy point of view, A can be arbitrary, but in fact they prove that A has to be positive. And then, then you, there's two ways of seeing this. One is let's not even think about the UV, but just think about the, the IR, but but think about the IR in some non-trivial background. So for example, you can think about this theory and then Lorentz violating background. So that means that I'm taking partial mu phi to be some constant. Of course, this is a constant vector and therefore you, you break Lorentz invariance. 
In this Lorentz violating background, uh, you can look at the equation of motions for the fluctuation around this background. And it will satisfy the dispersion relation, which is modified by the background value, uh, which is proportional to A. And of course, in order for you to, to not have superluminal modes, that actually tells you that, that, that A must be positive. So this is one way to see that there's actually a bound on the coefficient without even thinking about the UV at this point. And you see that there's actually, there should be a positive bound. If you think about the UV, you actually get the same result. So if you think about UV and you require unitarity, then what, what one does is, which is what we'll do in, the, in mostly in this talk, is that let's just consider the forward scattering amplitude. So in the low energy limit, the forward scattering amplitude is just going to be A S squared, where this is four derivative and therefore this is just S squared. And therefore you can write down the identity, which is A is just, you're, you're doing, consider this as a complex function, uh, a, comp, a complex function of S. And so let's just do a counter integral around the origin. And since ms0 at, at the origin is given by the low energy, low energy form, therefore this is just an identity. It just picks up the pole and gives you A. But then we can deform the counter uh, to, from the red one to this uh, yellow one. And since we're in the four limit, we know that, for example, uh, anomalous threshold various singularities are not there. And therefore, all the discontinuities, uh, the non analyticity is, is, is sitting on the real axis. So that means after deforming the counter, you're going to pick up the imaginary part along the real axis, as well as contribution from infinity. And since this is s to the third power, you can just using the Frosov bound, you know that the infinity will not contribute. And therefore, all of this A is just given by the discontinuity along the real axis, which through the optical theorem, you know, is just proportional to the cross section. And therefore, this is positive. So unitarity from the UV and causality in the IR, they both give the same conclusion that this coefficient uh, is positive. So in this talk, we would like to explore basically what characterized the, the image of unitarity. So here you can say that unitarity, the image of unitarity is that this coefficient is positive. Now we, we, we're, we, now we were more ambi ambitious. We don't want to just talk about the leading four derivative operate we want to is there a way to characterize this constraints of unitarity for all of the co Wilson coefficients and to all orders and furthermore the, one of the interesting story here is that you can get non-trivial you can have a connection between the i in some sense you have a connection between the ir and and and, and uv through the cft and so actually by just requiring that these uh, Wilson coefficients lie within what is required by unitarity will it actually in turn up, turn this upside down and start to impose constraints actually on the UV theory. And uh, we'll show you that indeed this will happen. And this, and you might say that, hey, I'm just using uni, UV conditions to bound these things. So why am I getting any, any feedback, uh, feedback bar, uh, to, towards the full UV theory? And the answer is because even, so the UV imposed conditions on these Wilson coefficient, but at low energy, you have symmetries. And so by using these symmetries, uh, for example, uh, crossing symmetry, this symmetry alone will actually now tell you something about the UV spectrum, which is one of the main points that I want to give uh, in this talk. Okay, so since I'm talking about the space uh, of Wilson coefficient, so let me just talk about what do I mean by the two different descriptions of spaces. spaces. So, uh, so let's say we have a finite region, so finite region here, so I can talk about this finite region in two different point, from two different points of view. So first is the vertex center, which the, the region is, is defined by this vertex. And so the, then this finite region can be characterized by what is known as the convex hall. So you just sum over all positive uh, contribution, you consider all possible positive sums of these vertices and all positive, uh, and the, the, the region where, where uh, you, it's covered by all possible uh, a positive sum is equivalent to this region. So that's the convex hall. And, and, and in a nutshell, this is just like the center of mass. So if you have a bunch of particles here, you ask whether it's the region of the center of mass, uh, can, where the center of mass can lie, and that gives you this uh, pentagon, this polygon region. So from the vertex center of view, this space is represented through the convex hall. On the other hand, you can consider slicing this region by boundary. So let's, so in here, this is two dimensions. So you have a bunch of lines and you're considering 
uh, the region where is where is for each line is, is sitting on a particular sign. So that means that you're carving out the space by, by a bunch of hyperplanes. And so you're carving out the space through a series of inequalities. So here we're using inequalities. Then you use the inequalities to carve out the space. So uh, basically the, the theory space we're talking about is going to, so it's, it's going to uh, arise by, so this the unitarity will give you a representation in this form. And then we're going to translate this form into this form. And so once you translate to this form, then you see that you have what this says tell you is that you have a bunch of boundaries that carves out this space. So let's see how this happens. So first is that these Wilson coefficients are given by a convex hull. So of course, first of all, we start with the unitarity and causality that tells us the bound for fixed t, for fixed small t and bigger than zero at uh, infinity, this is basically bounded by S squared. So that means that if I consider this counter integral, let's say set t equal to zero, now I'm going to uh, neglect the massless po and the massless cuts for the moment. Uh, once again, I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. And then uh, of course, because of this bound, this integral at infinity is going to vanish for n greater than one. So from s to the third, s to the fourth, this integral is gonna vanish. If this integral is going to vanish, then that tells me that uh, whatever contribution I pick up at the origin is going to be related to the pose or a discontinuity on the real axis, as we mentioned before. At the origin, because I'm, we're going to have a, a, an EFT description, and therefore you're going to have a polynomial expansions in S with these uh, kinematically defined Wilson coefficients. And so this is basically just what we discussed before. These coefficients are now defined by a counter integral around the origin, which you can deform to infinity. And therefore you have this identity, which tells you each of these coefficients are positive. Now we would like to extend this away from t equals zero. So we're gonna move away from the forward limit. Once you move away from the forward limit, now you have access to more Wilson coefficients. So basically now all Wilson coefficients can be accessed. And it's going to be given by the discontinuity, but not that for the four amplitude, but the four amplitude with any with some small t for fixed t. So each of these coefficients, since since we're looking at small t, so we can we can consider it as a Taylor expansion in t. So each of these coefficients is basically going to be given by the Taylor expand uh, the, the the Taylor expansion of the discontinuity or the residue on the pose and the branch cut. Now importantly. Uh, Lorentz invariance in the UV as well as unitarity suggests that the discontinuity and the residue must be positively expanded on the Gegenbauer polynomials, on the orthogonal polynomials. In four dimension, it's going to be the Legendre polynomial. So in this talk, we're focused on four dimensions. So not only do we know it's given, it, 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 so we actually know more information about the residue and the discontinuity. It's actually given, it must have this form, it has a positive expansion. And so this positive, this positivity here is going to be the, the root of the, the reason we have a convex hull. So basically GKQ is going to be given by a positive sum of contributions along the, the positive real axis. Here I have right U here, is, which reflects the contribution from the negative S axis, which reflect U channel thresholds. So we're gonna have contribution from S and U channel thresholds there's no contribution from T because we're considering fixed T. So there, we only, we're all, we're, this dispersion relation will only contain S and U. Now, of course, this is familiar to, 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 to most people. And so actually this analysis has been uh, pursued for, uh, for a long time. And even more recently, there's these very nice papers. I just mentioned a few uh, that was to build the analysis uh, basically essentially using this dispersion relations. Um, so the, uh, if one, one, so in this talk, what I want to uh, more emphasize is that this, uh, this relation here actually encodes some very beautiful mathematical structure underneath. So we start with this dispersion relation. So let's actually do the Taylor expansion. So if you do the Taylor expansion, then basically you're going to get a relation that looks like this. So uh, since, um, since it doesn't make any difference for me whether or not this, this corresponds to uh, discrete states or continuous states. So everything, I'm just going to write it as a sum. Uh, 
So you basically, the, the statement is that this Wilson coefficient is given by the sum of positive thing multiplied by this U thing here, which is the Taylor coefficients of the expansion of your Legendre or Gegenbauer polynomial. And this is weighted by the mass of that spec uh, of whatever states that is contributing. So this might not be very illuminating, but if I just organize this with different Q, uh, so remember Q is an expansion in T, so, so different Q is higher and higher order in the spin dependence. Then you basically have that this vector here is given by the positive sum of another of a set of uh, vertices here. So this is exactly the vertex point of view. And so we immediately know that these things actually live in a higher dimension space, a higher dimension polytopal space. But what is that polytope? And the, the, so that's really the, the important uh, point of this talk is that that polytope is something that is very special and we have we know exactly all the boundaries. So just to illustrate this, uh, let me just first focus on the S channel contribution because this will in turn actually covers everything. So if I just consider the S-channel con uh, contribution, once again, I have my coefficient is given. So this is just from the S-channel expansion of the Legendre polynomial. So this, this would be more illuminating if I write it in this form. So if I organize everything in this form, then you see that basically what you have is a product geometry. It's actually a convex hall of a product geometry where on one side you have the mass of the state, the other side is basically encoding the information of the spin. I can even make this more simpler by noting that these coefficients that you get from expanding the Legendre polynomial, you can actually organize it to, into a polynomial of this form where instead of using spin, I'm using J, which is actually the irreducible, uh, the, 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 the quantum number of the irreducible representative is L times L plus one. If you organize it into a polynomial in terms of J, then you immediately see that just do a further linear transformation on, along this direction you can organize this into this form. Now, this form is extremely beautiful because it's basically telling you that it's a convex hall, a product of moments. These are just moments. These are just, for example, if I call this X, this is X or X squared, X th X3, X4. This is the same thing, J, J squared, J3. So this is just a, a product of moments here. So in other words, at the core of the, these couplings are basically governed by the convex hall of product moments. Since this is very simple, we expect that we can actually characterize the complete boundaries of this space, and indeed we can. And so the tool, so so the tool is uh, basically what what is uh, called the Henkel matrix, so which I'll introduce here. So once again, the space that we're in, interested in that co governs all these uh, EFT couplings are basically the space of product of moments. So I just write it like this. So you have moments in x a direction. So x a is the mass related to the mass and therefore it's positive. Ya is related to the spin is also positive. So both of these are positive curves. So, so first uh, to see how do you carve out this space, uh, let's forget about the Y part. Just look at the single X part. So basically we're asking, so we have V the vertex center point of view is we have a bunch of uh, coefficients here, which will be our EFT coefficients given by the positive sum of, of things that live on the moment curve. What does this space look like? Well, if I just take these two components and if I plot it out, uh, then this is how the space will look like. And of course, this, not only are they positive, but they're actually living in this, this, this curve and this, this, uh, this, this curve on the, on the upper uh, corner here. Uh, here is just uh, to show you that if I've actually bound my X to be between zero and one. So if you actually assume that you know the information of your gap, it turns out that the, 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 you actually have more information. You're bounding this X between zero and one where one is normalized by the gap. So how do you characterize this space? Well, you can characterize it by collecting uh, these coupling here into this uh, Henkel matrix. And this space is basically characterized by the positivity of the determinant of the Henkel matrix, okay? So this is the face center uh, description of this space. And you see that from the face uh, center description, this is a constraint on the couplings. So you can translate the vertex center point of view into a directly to, a, a, to, a, to the face center point of view and the face center point of view, this constrains the coupling space. 
And indeed that this has to be positive. You can just plug this into this formula here and you will see that this is just basically given by in this form. And so since PA1 and PA2 are all positive, this is, the, this is positive. So now we can generalize this to arbitrary dimensions. So you can generalize to, to, to higher and higher dimension. And so basically the, the boundary that carves out this vertex center is basically these two constraints. So you write the, yeah, you write the Henkel matrix. So this is a symmetric matrix. And you also need to shift the Henkel matrix. And then you just require that all the leading principal minors are positive. And that gives you this space. So V0 is positive, V0, V1, V2, the determinant of this is positive, the determinant of the three by three is positive. Combined with the positivity of the, sh the, the, the shifted Henkel, this translates into that uh, is given by this convex hall. And therefore, if, if your coupling is given by this convex hall form, then it must satisfy the positivities of all of these Henkel constraints. Great. So Sorry this for was my uh, question. I might have missed it. What what are x and y again? Could you just remind us? Uh... So, so so right now I'm just just writing it as a mathematical structure. So so in the real physical uh, case, x is the mass of the spectrum, uh, uh -huh. and and y is related to the spin. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And Yutin, did you tell us what this linear transformation was to go between the g's and the a's? Uh, it's just some, co uh, I, uh, I didn't, I mean, you can just work it out. It's, it's just some over universal co uh, uh, integer. It's just a matrix that is universal. It doesn't depend on, on L or, or J. It's just an overall uh, matrix. Okay. How do you find yeah. it roughly? Or well, roughly, it's, it's, just, it's just that. So, for example, here, you, you're, 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 so you can see from this formula here that this is a polynomial of degree zero in J. This is a polynomial of degree one in J. This is a polynomial of degree two in J. And so basically you just do a linear transformation such that it just becomes one J, J square and J cube. So, it's, so okay. it's, yeah, it's just like row reduce, something Thanks. like row reduce, yeah. Okay, so the Henkel matrix is the constraints for a single moment curve, but the, the geometry that we're interested in is in the product moment curve. And so for that, so the geometry we're really interested in is not just a single curve, but it's actually a product curve. But you can easily uh, generalize this and to find the, the various constraints. So of course, for the product curve, if you look at each row or each column, it's still given by a single curve. So you already have the constraint of the previous Hengel constraints that I introduced. For each of these rows, so you just consider the Hengel matrix of this row, or you consider, the, uh, sorry, of this column, any of these columns, or you, you consider the Henkel matrix of any of these columns, then uh, they, ha they all have to be positive. But of course, you expect more constraints. And indeed, you can consider, for example, if you consider the Henkel matrix of the row of that, and just take any minors of the Henkel matrix, you can form. So let's say you, could, you take one of the principal minors of uh, the Henkel matrix from this row. And you also take the same principal minor from the Henkel matrix of this row and this row. Now you can organize it into a new Henkel matrix. And now this Henkel matrix will also be positive. And you can prove that this is indeed true. So, so, so first you have the row Henkel matrix, you take any of the minors and then you combine it for the different rows into a new Henkel matrix. And this have to be a uh, positive uh, as well. So we call this the Matroshka Henkel because of this Henkel inside a Henkel. Uh, structure here. So once you have this product geometry, now you have an infinite set of these Matroshka Henkel constraints. And this will basically carve out the space uh, associated with the product curve. Great. So now back to physics. So remember that I just mentioned before that this, this structure is mapped to the physical uh, picture, where here y, uh, I guess I switched between y and x, uh, but uh, so y is related to the mass of your spectrum, which is positive, and x is related to the spin, the, the j. So they're all moments here, and so that means, and so that means that the physical, uh, sorry, that means these a couplings, which remember was just a linear transform from the real physical couplings, is bounded by an infinite set of these Matroshka uh, angle constraints. So. If we just have the so so if we, if we just have the 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 s channel contribution, 
uh, which we call the, so, so which, whose geometry we'll call the SCFT hedron. So basically we can get the bounds on physical couplings in this way. So once again, we have the A geometry, which is given by this form, and this is bounded by the matryoshka hankel constraints. We do a GL rotation back into the physical coupling. So that translates the geometry into the physical coupling. And of course, we can now talk about the low energy symmetry. So for example, since we only have S channel uh, uh, contribution right now, we can think of this as some open string amplitude where it only has S and T contribution. Then it must satisfy cyclic symmetry. And so this defines a, a symmetry plane because that, because that means that these couplings have some linear relations. And so the, 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 the space you'll be interested in is the intersection of the symmetry plane with this, uh, this S geometry here, which is a, just a rotation of the space that is carved out by the Henkel constraints. So this is what we call the SEFD hedron, which is just the simple transformation. You have this geometry, you do a GL rotation and you ask for intersection. So just to show you how the space look like. So for example, if you have this, uh, the, let's just, for example, consider uh, expanding to this order and uh, these will be related to D6 phi to the four or D8 phi to the four operators. So this is basically the, the space that, that is being carved out between. So of course this is multi-dimensional. So you can just slice out in any direction you want. So this is the, the region and carve out by geometry between G31 and G30. There's different lines here. Um, so just in terms of which, what the, 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 which various constraints we impose. Uh, the, the important thing is just that the solid blue line here is, is basically when you throw everything at it, when you impose all the complete geometry constraints, uh, uh, this is the region that is carved out by the blue line. Uh, this red line is, is what we get uh, by doing, uh, so of course this is, you can actually, um, approach this problem from a semi-definite linear programming point of view. And so you can also try to carve out the space numerically. And so this is how, this is the, the red dots are what is carved out by numerics. Uh, you'll see that in this upper left corner, there's a slight mismatch here. And uh, so this has to do with uh, what we call finite size, size effect. And that is basically really, so of course this problem is well studied in, by mathematicians. And so the statement is that these constraints that I've just listed here are basically a uh, necessary constraint, but they're actually not sufficient constraints. So in other words, these are constraints that if you live, if your space is given by the convex hall, this must be true. But the fact that this is, this is true doesn't necessarily mean that it's given by this convex hall form. And there's a discussion about where this mismatch ha happens. And, and, and uh, indeed it happens at the, near some of the boundaries and this is basically what is causing this mismatch here. And so basically hunting down the, the final uh, uh, constraints that give us the necessary condition is basically what we're actually trying to do now. But uh, yeah. But of course we don't have just S channel contribution. There any real physics, any real systems has both S and U contributions. So, uh, in that case, uh, basically the, the new uh, information comes from that besides, so, so now let's consider just general AB to AB scattering. And since I'm considering AB to AB, I'm going to define my EFD couplings in terms of new variables, T and Z. Z is just related to S and U by this linear transformation. But the important point here is just that I'm using Z to reflect the fact that the thresholds from the S and U is actually identical. So they are actually given by uh, the same uh, residue. So uh, in a nutshell, you basically do exactly the same thing. Uh, you already have the S channel geometry. So now you have an extra contribution from the U channel, which is related from the S channel by another GL rotation. And therefore your, your, your geometry is given by the S channel hall as well as the U channel hall where the U channel hall adds on this extra uh, GL rotation. And therefore the geometry is very simple. Remember that we that if you want the full geometry, you want to take the S channel and then you do a further geo transformation to get the U channel. Therefore, basically, it's still a projection down from the original geometry. So you start from the original geometry, which is given by the matryoshka hankel constraints. You first rotate back into S and then you further project, which gives you the, the SU contribution. And, and, and that gives you the SU geometry. And for example, if you want to consider identical scalars, then you will have permutation invariance 
which means that your amplitude should satisfy permutation symmetry, then the intersection plane is the permutation plane. And so once again, you have uh, the, the, the intersection geometry. So can this, I ask one this, more naive, naive question here? Sure. So, I mean, a question I would have is, I think what you're telling me is you assumed at the start, for instance, you have a scalar field, you wrote down the most general couplings in a derivative expansion. And then by clever arguments, you can derive a set of constraints on those couplings, which you're gonna call the FTHedron. Yes. Um, a, a question you could ask is, if you decided to start adding particles at very high masses to the EFT hedron, so, so you, instead of wanting the consistent theory of exactly a phi particle, you allowed yourself to start adding particles above some mass M1 and then M2 and then M3. To what extent is the mathematical structure you find robust or to what extent does the space deform in a large way? I mean, you, you know what I'm asking, right? If you can easily deform the constraints by integrating out massive physics, um, is, is there some effective dimensionality that, that you should keep in coupling space if you're gonna start adding particles above a certain mass or to what extent is the, is the space robust? Uh, so, okay, so, well, first of all, these, so, so you see that I'm, I'm, I'm bounding G, for example, G31 and G30. Actually, this is a normalization where G20 is normalized to one. So really what I'm bounding is bounding the ratio of these couplings. So, 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 that, so in, other, in other words, this is a scaleless bound. So these, the, so the, the the couplings. I mean, we're, we're bounding the ratio of these rows. Of course, these rows of in, in, in principle have scales in them, but because I'm bounding them uh, in terms of ratio, so this is scalar. So if you add more particles, they all have to satisfy the bound. So this doesn't assume what kind of spectrum I have to begin with. So, so as your, long claim as is, your claim is that on this subset of couplings in a theory with more particles, you would get exactly the same bounds on the shape. Yeah, because I'm not assuming the the, the, the particle content to begin with. The external say, yeah, the only thing is that I have these masses particles. So, so that, that's the only thing I assume. And I don't assume what actually the UV spectrums that you actually have. So- Oh, I'm sorry, so, yeah, you're and, right. At this, at this point, you're just writing a general expansion of M and ST, but to translate it into a space in the, to a constraint in the space of couplings, you would actually have to assume something about external particles. External, yeah, the, the mass, yeah, that they're massless. Well, when you say you're, you're you're doing something model independent. It's because you've expressed it in terms of an amplitude m of s and t. But to translate this back into constraints on couplings, you presumably uh, need to make assumptions about the particle spectrum. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. And my question is, how robust are the constraints on theory space, which are constraints in terms of the particle spectrum? But but maybe, uh, it, it's it's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you, if I want to talk about constraints on the particle spectrum, of course, here these are constraints on the Wilson coefficients. So, 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 but to, to get constraints on the particle spectrum, it will be on the second part of my talk. So actually we will de derive constraints on the, on our particle spectrum, but here we're constrained, we're constrained, we're doing constraints on these, uh, sorry, we're doing constraints on these couplings. So, so these are just direct constraints and they're constraints on the ratios of these couplings. So this is indeed part model independent. These couplings def that doesn't depend on whatever UV thing you have. Or am I misunderstanding the question? I'll, I'll, I'll expand on it after the talk because I, I let, let me try to expand on it. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. And once again, you see that, the, so this is a space that is carved out by the geometry. And once again, this is the SDP, uh, the linear programming uh, 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 bounds. And you see again this mismatch, which is once again related to this uh, sufficient and uh, uh, that, that, that the the geom the, the current bounds that the, the current uh, boundaries that we have for the geometry are necessary boundaries, but they're not su sufficient. And uh, so this is related to that issue. Okay, so uh, I think uh, it's running out of time, so I'm going to go as slightly faster. But it's going to be more about the examples. So for example, you now you have these. Uh, so we can, for example, for the SCFD hedron, where you only have the S channel thresholds. Uh, we can present, for example, the, the Higgs exchange, uh, where you have a massive box, or you even have type one string theory. So all of these gives you Wilson coefficients, and they will give you, uh, and, and we can have uh, consider the ratios of these Wilson coefficients and see where they sit in the EFT. So if, for example, on the five derivative coupling, so I just carve out a particular space, and, and you can see that most of these theories are actually sitting at the corner uh, of the loud region in the, in the, in the EFT.
and I, and I will comment on that more very soon. Uh, just to mention that I, I was doing talking about scalars, but you can do the same thing with a helicity state. So instead of just a, a EFT of scalars, I can talk about EFT of gravitons and photons. The only thing that changes is that instead of these legender, instead of legender polynomials, you now you actually have Wigner D matrices here, which encodes a different uh, helicity orientation of your external states. And but then you can do still do exactly the same thing. And so just to show you an example, so if you have all photons on the outside, for example, the D8 F to the four operator uh, must live in this region, and the D8 R to the four operator must also live in some finite region. Uh, once again, we can look at string theory. For this, uh, for this graviton EFT sector. So if we look at string theory here, uh, so you see that I have super string, bosonic string, and heterotic string. It's actually a little bit uh, covered up by the labeling. But the point is that they're all very, and sitting around a very tiny region. But actually the original region is actually not very big already because the ratio are, I mean, these are actually in a very finite region. But it turns out that the known EFTs are always in some tiny corner. So we would like to ask why. Why is it that the that so this so this space is basically carved out by just assuming that that uh, you have unitary in the UV. But why is it that whenever we look at explicit DFT, they're always like the, they're always sitting in this tiny these tiny corners of the allowed region. And the reason is actually there's there's one uh, place where we know that we can improve. And that is that we remember when we defined the EFT hedron, we were just defining this, we were just giving this as a positive sum where this positivity is required by unitarity. But actually we know something more in any physical theory. We know that this, this uh, which I'll call spectral function is heavily suppressed in higher spin. So for example, you just, just take a massive box, you can compute the discontinuity and then you can expand the, the, the discontinuity again on the legenda polynomial. The spectral function here is positive, which is indeed you can write it as a complete square of some function that I call FL of S. But if I plot out FL of S, you see that there's an exponential suppression at high spins. And indeed, this high spin suppression is what is at the root of why these things are all sitting here. Because if you look at what the vertices here, these are actually the low spin vertices here. So, and indeed, if you look at string theory, it's the same thing. So this is, a, so basically I, I list here, the, the, you can take the string theory, you can take the residue of the string theory, uh, the string four point amplitude, and then expand it on the Geigenbauer polynomials. And these are the coefficients in front. If you plot it uh, against uh, the level and with the PL, you see that uh, for each level, the lowest spin is actually always dominant on, over higher spins. And in fact, this, this phenomenon of large spin suppression has been uh, recently actually utilized uh, by the work of Zeeburn, uh, Demetrius, and Sasha. But we would like to ask, does, large, does this large uh, spin suppression actually emerge from this geometry of the EFT hedron? And if so, to which extent? In other words, since if it actually emerges, then that would tell us that the EFT hedron is actually giving bounds back on the UV spectrum now, because it's requiring that. So these are just explicit example, but it's actually telling you that there's some bounds that are on, on this uh, spectral functions that are related to spin. So how to see that there's actually bounds? So remember, so I'm just gonna draw this, this cartoon picture of the geometry. So basically we have this, some EFT hedron and we're intersecting the symmetry plane. And the important point is that whenever we do the intersection of a symmetry plane, if you look at the explicit graph, it's always a finite region here. Why is it a finite region? The reason is because once, when you consider intersection, there's only a minority of vertices on one side of the plane. A majority is on the other side, okay? So that means that there's a balancing between the higher spin contributions with the lower spin contributions uh, to, for, in order for it to be living on this intersecting. So to, to have more control about this balancing behavior. So we'll consider, so, so that means that for any physical uh, spectrum, uh, you must be living on this plane, which translate into that, the, that uh, the image of the convex hull of this physical spectrum must have zero image perpendicular to the plane in orthogonal directions. So this leads to what in the community call null constraints. So constraints which tell you that there must be no, uh, no component orthogonal to the symmetry plane. 
So for example, uh, at uh, k equals eight, the null constraint translate into that these uh, couplings uh, must have these linear relations. Now remember that each of these couplings have a dispersive representation. So I can just plug in the dispersive representation for these couplings here. Then I get a formula that looks like this. I have a positive sum uh, of mi squared to some power times some polynomial. But the important thing is that this thing has to sum to zero. Now, importantly, since this is a polynomial, that means it only has finite roots. So that tells you there's a non-trivial constraint. So for example, let me just show you here. So let me just use the permutation invariant con constraint. So for example, for k equals four, this is the polynomial. Now, the, the requirement is that this must sum to zero. Uh, if, you, if I plug in the spins, since this is finite root, you know that after certain spins, this is all going to be positive. In fact, the only thing that is negative here is actually spin two. So this immediately tells you that if the theory, the U, the, 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 this UV completion of, of, of scattering of scalars uh, have any higher spin, it must at least have spin two. Otherwise, there's no, there's no chance of balancing this, of letting this thing goes to zero. So spin, spin two must be part of the spectrum. Now you can go to the next order, k equals seven. And now you have two null con conditions, you have two different directions, but you can do a linear combination to get this polynomial whose sign pattern is now look like this. And now the only thing that is negative is spin four. So now you get the conclusion that spin four must be part of the spectrum. So you can do this more and more and more, and you can actually show that right now we can show that anything below spin two, 28, even spins uh, below 28 must be part of the spectrum. And this is just using this, uh, this, this, this null constraint idea. And uh, of course, for generic theory, th this isn't surprising because if you, have, if you have some particle at m square, you know that you're going to have a two particle threshold at four m square, which is gonna have infinite spins because it's a two particle threshold. But let's say if you have some theory which you have another weak coupling. So for example, like string theory, where you can, where you, where you can suppress the two particle threshold then this is a statement that anything which you have this extra coupling, which allows you to suppress the two particle threshold, that theory must have all of these spins below 28 already. So this is we, this, just from the fact that, that, of, that you have this dispersive representation. Actually, you have more information about just the spin. You actually also have a, a bound on their uh, spectral parameters. So let me define something called the average spinning spectral function. So what this means is I'm, I'm, I'm summing all of this. So for example, if L equals four, I'm considering all the states that is spin four and I'm doing it and, and, and it's there, each of these states is weighted by their mass. And so this is uh, what I call the average spinning because it's weighted by the mass. In terms of these, uh, this average uh, spectral function, uh, actually the null constraint can be written in a very simple form. And you see that this actually imposes non-trivial bounds on the ratio of these, uh, these uh, spinning spectral function. And the reason is very simple. So uh, it's just from the fact that this is a polynomial. So for example, if the polynomial looks like this, then you see that the maximal value of, for example, the spin four, since this has, the negative has to cancel the positive. That means that the, uh, the maximal value this positive thing can have is that everything so, so is that all the positivity is coming from spin four, that, that this cancels the negative part. So if you know already, we know that we must have spin two, there's no spin three for, uh, for permutation in, in, invariant scalar. So you only have the spin two. So that tells you there's actually a bound on the ratio between the spin four contribution and the spin two contribution in order for this to cancel. And for those of you who, who, who work with a CFD bootstrap, you know, know this is very similar to the OPE maximization. So indeed we can derive bounds. So for example, we can derive, since we know that spin two must be in our spectrum. So now we have exact, uh, sorry, I mean, we have uh, analytic bounds on the, the average spectral function of, uh, of spin L with, with respect to the spin two. So this is at K equals four and this is at K equals five. And this is basically, bounded by, uh, so they're all, at large L, they're polynomial suppressed. And as you go to higher and higher K, you can see that these bounds are all coming down. This is a log plot, by the way. Sorry, this should be a log here. And this uh, linear line, which is the exponential suppression is coming from this, uh, this amplitude here. 
this STU amplitude. This is this is this amplitude is like the Ising model of the, the S matrix bootstrap, which is that this amplitude actually is, you can show that, that it's not a physical amplitude because if you sit at S channel, that it, is actually you have an infinite number of states at M square. But in most of the bounds, this amplitude actually appears at the corner of, of, of the bound. So this is like the Ising model of the S, S matrix bootstrap. And you can see that as an increase in K, uh, these bounds are actually now coming closer to, 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 the, to the, the, this ratio uh, for this theory. Um, and you can also consider external, you can also consider uh, spinning states. Now the symmetry is going to be, since I'm organizing my helicity to be the same helicity in one, two, and three, four. And so there's a one, two symmetry. So you can do exactly the same thing. And so just since I'm really running out of time, so just I just say the results. So for example, you can show that for gravity uh, in the U channel, you must have a spin four state because here, so this is H equals two. So you must have a, so you see that uh, from this constraint alone, you must have a spin four state in order for this to respect the one, two symmetry. And you can also similarly derive bounds for, for so this is, a, of course, H equal one is for uh, photon EFT, H equals two is for gravitational EFTs. There's also bounds for uh, this average spinning uh, functions with respect to, since you already know that you must have the spin four, you can derive bounds for everything else with respect to spin four. Um, okay, great. So let me just uh, conclude here. So we've constructed the space of EFT that is consistent with having a unitarity and Lorentz invariance in UV completion. And basically the statement here is that the space is given by the convex hollow product moment curves. And we've seen that the, the low energy, the fact that the low energy theory enjoys crossing symmetry actually impose non-trivial constraints on the UV spectrum. And in particular, we see, we've seen that impose constraints on what spins must appear and you, can, and you can also have constraints on their spectral functions, the ratio of the spectral functions. And we actually indeed see that you have this large spin suppression uh, here. And of course, there's many th more things to do. You can consider constraints from non-identical states. And actually there's another thing that we should have imposed, which it would be nice to incorporate into geometry, which is that the spectral parameter actually has a natural upper bound from unitarity alone, which is it must be bounded by two. So it will be nice to consider the, the, the incorporation of this constraint. Now, uh, since I mentioned this, that uh, the, the, the issue about masses loop has arisen, so let me just uh, talk about this uh, briefly. So uh, again, indeed, when, when, and previously I didn't consider masses loop and therefore I can define my EFT coefficients here by doing a counter integral. Of course, in, in generic uh, cons considerations, you're gonna have a masses cut all the way through the origin. And if as the mass is cut all the way through the origin, then this counter integral is no longer well-defined. However, what you, in this case, what you should do is you should actually move this uh, pole away from the origin. So for example, I can move this pole array, define my EFT coefficient slightly off the real axis. So I'm going to define it in this form. So since I'm defining it slightly off the real axis, uh, that means that my now, this way of de defining my EFT coefficient now has a scale dependence, which it should because things are running. And so the, the, so the statement is that once you have masses cut, what you should do is you should define the EFT coefficients uh, in this form, which has uh, which not is in terms of some uh, integral around the origin, but some integral that actually uh, cap that actually encircles these poles here. And it is these EFT coefficients that will satisfy the bounds. And uh, there's some several examples where we, we actually give in the paper that came out uh, in December last year. And I, I, and I should mention that, uh, for example, in Simone's and uh, Francesco's uh, work, so uh, Simone's and Francesco's uh, work here, uh, they actually do uh, similar things. So, so instead of uh, consider instead of considering moving this off the real axis, what they consider is actually defining the EFT coefficients by integrating through an arc here. So again, once you integrate through an arc, that can introduce scale dependence and that scale dependence is tied to the running. But in either way, once you de properly define your EFT coefficients in this matter, then the, the previous geometry will apply to those EFT coefficients. So that's basically the, 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 the punchline. Okay, thank you very much. So this is... Uh, end of the talk. Uh, let's thank you, Tim. And, uh...
Are there further questions? Hey, Uten. Hey, there, there's also partial wave bounds that are upper bounds on the partial wave coefficients, right? But you guys never use those. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Is that related to kind of ignoring massless cuts or? Uh, no, it's just that we haven't, I mean, we haven't in incorporated this into our geometry. And indeed, if you actually incorporate this, uh, some of the bounds will become tighter. And actually, Simone and, and Simone's uh, paper. So that's what P less than two means. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's what's actually Simone actually tried to do this. And he, uh, and even though he, once again, so it, it'll be nice to systematically implement this. So he tried to do this uh, in, 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 in his last paper, and uh, that he showed that there's there's indication that this, of course, this will will shrink the space a little bit even further. But, it, but uh, it remains open to how to implement this bound uh, systematically. Yeah, this will be one of the things that we want to do. Thanks. Yeah, so I don't know if Shamit, uh, uh, Quite yeah, let me, let me try to ask my question again. And it, it's not a question that probably people in this community think about a lot, but I'm just, I haven't really followed. So your, your constraints, as I understand it, are on basically the coefficients and the S and T expansion of amplitudes, which you can state in terms of external mass. You, know, you, 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 you scatter certain external massless particles, you get some answer, and then you get right. constraints from a consistent S matrix. I'm fine right. with that. And those constraints are universal for any theory with that low energy spectrum. They give you constraints on the, the Fourier coefficients of S and T. Right. Okay. Now, here's another question you could ask, which is actually related to the way you actually presented the talk. You had a theory of a phi particle. You wrote the Wilson coefficients and the effective action of that of that of that particle, right? Um, but if you are doing random physics, you might, as a model builder, also introduce you know various massive particles. Now you have in the Lagrangian the coefficients of the powers of phi, but also mixing terms between phi and these massive particles and all kinds of other crap, right? Right. If you state the geometric constraints, not in terms of coefficients of S and T, which is the intelligent thing to do, but in terms of coefficients that appear in the Lagrangian that multiply powers of D phi and these other massive particles, presumably those constraints are now deformed in some horrible way because the way that they enter in M of S and T and other intelligent gauge invariant quantities you know, of, of, of the S matrix depends a lot on the way you stated the, the coefficients in the Lagrangian in terms of particles. My question is, are there natural geometries that emerge in coupling constant space and how robust are they to changes of the particle content? Because after all, that's how a model builder would have written down the Lagrangian to begin with, right? They wouldn't write, here's my guess for all the amplitudes. They would introduce some set of particles, some very massive and write some coefficients there. And then, and then you wanna constrain those coefficients. So that was my question. So one thing, yeah, so, so there's two things one can do. So, so, so you're talking about an EFT Lagrangian, which basically actually includes both massless and massive states. Yeah, it's not an EFT have, anymore because you've included the massive states and they're at some yeah. scale M. And you know, there could be a hierarchy of them. And my question is, can you robustly state how invariant the low energy geometry you'd find on coupling constants for the phi particle is if you start going to higher and higher energies and write the Lagrangian at higher and higher scales, it deforms, it deforms, right? Is there, is there a notion of how robust that geometry is as you try to write it down for higher and higher, um, you, you know, um, for, for, for cutoffs that are move, move, moving down, if you want? Uh, well, first of all, so, so if I write down the Lagrangian involving the massive states, then also what, 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 so then if I integrate out that massive states that you have, then, then the, the, the resulting couplings will still, will, will of course be in this. So, so that, that's Absolutely. Not the so, so the complicated yeah. answer to my question would be, it's whatever gives you the correct constraints on exactly the massless Lagrangian, but that's a very um, non-constructive way of stating bounds. Yeah, right. but I think that uh, but I think that another interesting statement that one can make is, which is related, is that if I consider the scattering of this massive states that involve these massive states, so then the then the the, the then I will, I will I will consider the scattering of the massive amplitudes, and indeed I actually so so I think that there's some work I'm not I'm not familiar, but uh, so really. These things, I mean, this dispersion relation for the scattering of the massive states, massive states still holds. And so the only thing that has changed here is actually this, uh, let me see. So dispersion relation is still hold for the massive state. Uh, 
The only thing that changed here is now the relation with the scattering angle and the Mandel stand variable is now deformed. It's no longer just in terms of, I mean, it, it, this is a relation. So this is, there's gonna be an S minus four M square where the four M square is the, 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 the mass, the, the, the mass of the, the massive states. Now you actually have another geometry which is associated with, 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 with uh, this. And uh, I'm not, I think that some people have, have looked at it. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that, that, one, uh, that one can explore this geometry, which is when I actually have the massive state and I have these couplings of, uh, between the massless and the massive states, then they're basically governed still by this dispersion relation, but with the dispersion relation where these things are slightly deformed by the mass of say, and, 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 and what are the geometry that are associated with this? I think there is a question that can be asked. Yeah, that was basically my question. And, and my question was, was if people understand how smoothly one geometry truncates to another as you get rid of the massive states and so on, there will be a projection. Yeah, that's an interesting, and yeah, that's a, okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, that's something that, that, uh, that should be looked at, yeah. Thanks. Sure. What about this low spin uh, dominance? Is it expected from any physical intuition, or is it some sort of surprise? Uh, could you uh, like, yeah. I know, could you imagine some crazy theory where it's not satisfied? I know some so, Vasiliev, so... Vasiliev-like theory with like slightly gapped or something where you have lots of higher spin particles and they're all coupled equally strongly, or. Uh, of course, this is from an S matrix point of view, so you not you need to have B in flat space. Uh, yes, large spin. So, so actually, the, so there's an interesting point here, which is that, uh, for example, if you compare to this, what I call the the where is it? Uh, where I call the 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 Ising model of of, of 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 S matrix, it's actually the high spin suppression is actually exponentially suppressed, not polynomial expressed. So there's actually an easy way to see that. So, but so people know that uh, that a higher spins if you really go to large L, then the spectral function should be exponentially suppressed. And that's just a very simple physical reason. It's just, if you're exchanging a higher spin particle, you're gonna have T to the L power. And so in order for this, I mean, just in terms of four, four particle scattering, the, the exchange of a higher spin is gonna have some T to the L power. And, and, and so, so if, you, if the amplitude has any good high energy behavior, that thing has to be suppressed. And actually you can analytically show that uh, using dispersion relation to show that at large L limit, this thing should be exponentially suppressed. And, and, but that's at the large L limit. Uh, here, the bounds that we're showing is actually not at the large L limit, but actually at fi any finite L limit will satisfy these bounds. So, so this is in some sense, and even though this, is, this doesn't show exponential suppression, but, uh, this, but this shows that there's actually suppression even at finite L. And once again, the physical reasoning behind this is essentially that if you exchange a particle with, uh, with some spin, it's going to occur a T to the L power or said in another way, the, the Legendre polynomial is a polynomial of a degree uh, L and cosine theta and cosine theta is basically uh, linearly related to T. And so if it's behaving with some T to the L power, it better be that uh, it is suppressed at high L because otherwise in terms of energy, it's going to, be, it's going to grow. And so just the fact that the, the scattering amplitude is, is, is finite uh, tells you that there should be high spin suppression. So it's like here you're talking sort of for, for, for the contribution of a single particle state. Uh, yes. Or... Yes, a single particle state. So is it because if I remember your figures correctly, okay, you have some domain that is allowed by fundamental reasons, but then the actual theories we know, even including string theory, which has a bunch of higher spin particles, but still they were in some small corner. Right. Uh, right. But right. Uh, so are you saying that basically if I wanted to construct a theory that was, you know, in the other part of your physical domain, I would need like many, many higher spin particles. Like I will have to increase multiplicity of higher spin particles in the spectrum somehow very fast. Well, I mean, I, as you just said, yeah, but as you just said, string theory is in the corner. String theory has, has higher particles, higher spins, and they are actually still in the corner. And the reason that they're in the corner is because of this high spin suppression. Yeah, you, you need like way more high spin particles than in string theory, right? Uh, something uh, like this. Yeah, um, um, yeah, but then you, you, you run into this problem about this high, that it must still have this high spin suppression. 
actually you can start to run into this, uh, but uh, that's actually something something else. You can start to run into here if if you start to consider actually in, more along the lines of what Shamith was mentioning, which is that you, in, if you instead think about, let's say if you consider string theory, for example, and let's say if you, you do particle, uh, you, you have access to level N and everything above level N you're integrating out. So you, now you have an EFT which involves where you are actually see the massive pose to, le to, to level N and, and you integrate out the, 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 the higher states above that level, the resulting coefficients is actually going to start to, to go inside here. Of course, that's not a true low energy FT, but that, co so, so, so that, uh, uh, that EFT would, will actually have Wilson coefficient that starts to appear here. So, um, yeah, so we, we have actually, if, if you're interested, we have an explicit example of that in the paper uh, that was uh, some, that that was on the archive uh, last December. Uh, if you're interested, uh, yeah, let me just but, maybe I can. But yes, you, maybe if, before you go there, like like so, you cannot exclude this region right in the top of your picture from like any of these additional considerations you showed. Like they do not reduce this space, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so that means there's a large spin separation that we actually derive is not sufficient to re reduce it to the corner. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let so me just- you, uh, what, is, what is this U7 point, which is sitting right there where you're pointing? U7, uh, the green point there. Oh, no, this is just, uh, so we were doing the convex hall. So U7 is actually inside the hall. So I mean, so this is coming from, so, sorry. So this is, uh, yeah. So this is coming from the so convex hall of S channel and U channel. So those are vertices. So they were labeled U and S. So the S is the vertices from S channel and U are vertices from U channel. And so that U7 is just one of the vertices. So it just means that not all of the vertices are boundaries. Some of the vertices are actually already inside hall. Okay, so it doesn't label a particular theory in the way- Yeah, there's no theory the, here. Yeah. Okay, the other green points. Well, maybe it's just the red points, okay. So let me just, uh, maybe I can just uh, do this. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, just, I just want to show since uh, this is brought up. So this is the paper that was in December. So you actually, so we plotted, so, so here, um, right. So we, we basically do the following. So let's say if you have some theory where you actually have, no, have access to the, the, the contribution of massive uh, states up to level n and integrate out the remaining part and ask what does uh, these Wilson coefficients, how does these Wilson coefficient behaves as you integrate away higher, higher n. And so this is, once again, so string theory is in, is in this tiny boundary, but as you integrate away, uh, the, the Wilson coefficient starts going inside the EFT joint. Now it starts to go up. And these Wilson coefficients are defined in this, in this matter. So you have access to to, to the states up to level n and anything beyond n you integrate away. And so, so now you do indeed. So this is, the, this is one of the way where we, we know how to get theories which actually lives inside here. But that of course is not really a valid EFT because, because uh, if it, and, and once again, once you go back down to the extreme uh, IR, you're still going back down to here. But as you include as you include more and more states, the, the probably this is one of the this is partial answer to Shamit's question is that the Wilson coefficient starts to move inside. And uh, sorry, to move inside here. Are there systematic relations between um, con consistency conditions from the conformal bootstrap and consistency conditions in your space of coupling since you can always deform CFTs and then try to get some kind of, the high energy behavior might still be determined by what determined the CFT data. Um, you know what I'm asking? Yeah, can you, can you uh, say that again, sorry. Yeah, so, so there's a set of constraints on CFTs that come from the bootstrap. Right. Uh, you have a set of constraints on S matrices, and uh, you know I understand that an S matrix is not a great thing to talk about in a CFT, 
but but you might expect that that morally the the analog of the constraints you're getting on on couplings are are, are somehow coming from bootstrap constraints in CFT. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a sharp relationship between your your geometries and any geometries in space of coupling of CFTs coming from the bootstrap? Uh, not that I know of. Sorry, uh, but actually. Uh, a little bit tangential to, to, to this comment is that this, this, ge sorry, this uh, geometry that we have here, uh, this geometry that we have here, which uh, there will, this will be related to uh, some other, so there will be another paper probably in two weeks that will come out. Uh, this statement about this, uh, yeah, this uh, product of moments yeah, basically this geometry, or basically the product of moments. As of course, it actually appears in the CFD bootstrap, and it, and actually the most cleanest thing is uh, is in the modular CFD. So 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 sorry, modular the modular bootstrap. So there you have the partition functions. The partition function expanded on left and right characters, and so so we are, we are going to show that in that geometry is exactly of this form. So it's actually, actually exactly, and so now you have a translation indeed between these things. So here, instead of bounds, so here we have bounds in the space of couplings. There we're going to have bounds on the space of partition functions where the partition function is expanded on some self-dual points. And so the values of those part partition function actually are, have bounds. So for example, on the self-dual points, we're going to have lower bounds on the partition function. Of, this of, is an ADS3? Uh, uh, this is in, yeah, this is CFT2, yeah. CFT2, yeah. Um, now there, there's so no CFT2 matrix, on a right? torus, so. though. I see, I see. Yeah. Mm, okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay. If not, then let's thank you, Tin, again for a very nice talk. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And it's very nice seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Have a good day.